I am Jim Collison and live from our virtual virtual studios uh, around the world, or at least here in the United States. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on March 12th, 2021. <laughs> Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts, independent strengths coaches, share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our live chat. Actually, on the live page, there's a link right above me, and that'll just take you to the YouTube instance. Sign in with your Google account and drop in the chat. Let us know what's going on. There's a bunch out there uh, today, and we'd love to have that. If you're listening after the fact, you can always send us an email, and many of you do. Send that email to coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Call to Coach on any uh, podcasting platform. Great way to kind of keep up to date with all the things that are going on. If you're on YouTube there, you can sub sub uh, subscribe as well. And that way you get notifications whenever we publish something new. Dr. Jacqueline Robinson is our host today. She works as a learning and development consultant with Gallup. And Jacqueline, always great to have you on Call to Coach. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some of you might see a familiar face here. I am so excited to kick off today. I feel like it's uh, a round table with two, uh, with two of my favorite females plus Jim Collison. So um, <laughs> beyond excited. And you can be, you can be a female today if you would like. Honorary. As well, Jim. <laughs> All right. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> If you Take feel a, like a girl, then you're real like a girl. Embrace it. <laughs> let's not derail this. Jacqueline, <laughs> let's introduce our, our guest. Yes. So today we've got some guests here. We are going to discuss the difference between leadership versus management, um, because this often arises in the workplace as it relates to responsibilities, but also those necessary competencies for each one. So today on our episode of Call the Coach, we are welcoming back Micah Liebrandt. Uh, she is stepping in for Jeremy, who had something arise in a schedule. Uh, so I am so thankful that she was able to come in and connect with us today. Micah is a senior workplace consultant who helps leaders improve the lives of their followers. In her more than 10 years with Gallup, she has supported clients from five global offices, giving her an expansive expertise in employee and customer engagement. And Micah leads with strategic positivity, woo, ideation, and adaptability. Uh, so thank you for being adaptable, Micah. <laughs> Joining My us pleasure. Week. Thanks. It's great to be here. We have another familiar face for many of you. She was recently on Call to Coach uh, to discuss how to create a culture that inspires. Jessica Dawson is a learning and development consultant at Gallup, and she translates Gallup's research, management, science, and best practices into practical, compelling, and powerful programs. Jessica leads with futuristic, relator, activator, developer, and individualization. All right, ladies. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks. I'm excited to be here with some of my favorite people yeah. at Gallup. Yeah. And Gallup and beyond, I should say. Yes. Yes. So let's get right down into it. What is the difference between leadership and management? We get that often in our courses as well. It's like, what? How do, how do they manage differently? How do they lead differently? What's going on here? I'll yeah. jump in. Sorry. Oh, um, I think, you know, it, it, I don't want today to be an entire uh, TED talk on what, what we should call the people <laughs> in our organization. Um, mm. But just for glossary terms, typically, I mean, Gallup asks a lot of questions. We ask a lot of questions yeah. throughout organizations and try to map what we're learning. And typically for our own understanding, we do think about a difference between leader and manager being where they fall in the organization. So if you hear a lot of Gallup speak around what a manager manager does. What we usually mean is it is somebody who is in charge of leading people. Um, and we do tend to differentiate leader as somehow being in charge of leading people who lead people. Um, so there is a bit of a hierarchy to how we how we tag um, those pieces. Um, that's the boring answer. Jessica, do you want to jump in and give the more interesting <laughs> answer? Well, I, I love the the setup and I, I, there's so much overlap that it's it's important to make the distinction. I think the other thing that I would just add is what 
they are responsible for. So leaders typically are more responsible for creating the strategic vision of the overall organization. Um, they usually are even a little bit more removed from the front lines, right? So when we hear those terminologies of the top of the house, this is who we are usually referring to. Uh, and, and managers are more so getting people done through the work that they are giving them, right? So uh, I think it's good to set the definitions up here first mm -hmm. and also just talk about the similarities because there's a lot of overlap uh, in there as well. But that's how I would kind of differentiate them. I agree. Thank you all. And, and let's get right into the similarities because I think that's where a lot of confusion ends up um, coming to fruition is there does seem to be some overlap in some of the maybe responsibilities that they have or even some of the competencies that are required to manage and lead. So what would you say is similar about a manager and a leader? I'm just going to jump right in and say at the core of it, these are people that are managing people and people mm -hmm. are complex and people are messy. And there's a lot of mess that comes along with managing all of that. Um, so I think that in terms of the similarities, there is complexity around people. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that there is a similarity in terms of managing relationships. So it's not just about the people that are reporting into you, but it's also about managing all of the relationships that are around you, peers, um, you know, managing up, uh, managing across, right? And so I know we often will talk about that in our manage management uh, courses. Uh, and it's important to also just be able to call that out. It's a tough job. I, I, that was the number one similarity that came to mind when you asked that, um, was that it's hard. Mm -hmm. I, um, I got to join a client's a town hall this week. And what I was presenting overlapped what one of their senior leaders was presenting. And she said, hey, if you're looking for, um, you know, improving across a career ladder, really becoming a manager or a leader here at this organization, first, you've got to know it's really hard. Um, and I think that that's something often we forget, especially when you're a high achiever or or really bent toward any kind of, you know, Clifton Strengths flavor of execution. Mm -hmm. And you just want to do the next thing. Sometimes it's an oversimplification for the next thing to be, well, I need to be promoted to a manager. Um, we know from a lot of our research into, into natural talents that just about one in 10 human beings is born with the great talent to manage. And an additional two in 10 can be taught. That still leads you with a minority of people who yes. really are going to be world class in that position. So, I mean, the, the major commonality, I think, that between leaders and managers, however you're defining that in that hierarchy, is that it's a really hard job. And I think the very best in that role um, have a couple things that they tend to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from what their strengths are, but it does come from how they think about what their job truly is. Um, so, I mean, Gallup has, has studied the idea of leadership competencies, of manager competencies, and if you want to Google it, um, you can check out uh, one of Gallup's papers, Competencies 2.0 where we outline seven pretty universal expectations of great managers. And the cool thing about it is we know these are transferable across a role. So if you can figure out how to yes. build relationships, develop people, lead change in a manager position, where, as Jessica mentioned, you're a little bit closer to the front lines, um, that maybe there is an extension of those same expectations that might just be a, maybe a different dose or a different audience or a different kind of style on that but that those expectations do tend to remain the same, whether you are in an individual contributor role, a manager role, or, or a leadership role. I love that. It's creating that culture of inclusive leadership, where the leader is really encouraging others to be able to, um, you know, partake in the mission, feel like they can offer best practices, feel like they can be involved in process implementation and so forth. Everyone has that opportunity and ability to be um, a leader in their own right. That And I, you know what I love about that and what you two are both saying is that helps with succession planning. If we're helping everybody mm -hmm. think more from this inclusive leadership perspective, and you've got leaders that are helping managers think about, are you developing your people? But as a leader, they're also developing managers. As we start moving individual contributors into management or managers into leadership, we're creating a better pipeline of those that can then take over the role. 
for yeah, sure. Yeah. And think about how important it is really to democratize leadership development by mm -hmm. saying, here's what excellence looks like. Your access to that excellence is going to be individual to you, given what your most natural patterns of behavior are. Um, but, but here's really where we're aiming. Is that something you're interested in? And then at yes. the same time, how do we make rock stars in every role? So that if you're not drawn to leadership, if it doesn't light you up to go out there and actively show love to human beings through the systems that your organization has, let's figure out a way for you to be excellent in, in something else. For yes. sure. I think the other thing too, with both of these terms, leader and manager, there's a lot of power just in general that we give to verbiage. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes um, individual contributors or even managers, they, they give a lot of power to that word leader. And oftentimes we are demonstrating leadership capabilities or we are leaders in our own right without the title. So I think it's also just good to just be mindful um, of when you are maybe uh, demonstrating those leadership abilities and you're not necessarily having the title of a leader and or maybe mm -hmm. you're an individual contributor, but you're a person that's demonstrating even manager qualities. What do those look like? So I think that that's also just something to keep in mind. I love this notion of democratizing um, uh, the, the leadership and leadership development overall because we know that millennials are taking over the workplace. And in, in, yes. in four years, right, 75% of the workplace is going to be uh, millennials. And what we know about millennials, they are demanding development from their organizations. And the conventional approaches of, you know, maybe going to get your MBA or going to get professional degrees, they're not as shiny as they once were either. Mm -hmm. Right. Are, the millennials or the degrees? The degrees are not as shiny <laughs> as they once were. The millennials, okay. and I'm a millennial. I am a millennial, <laughs> and we are still Back shiny. Off, I'm <laughs> glow glitter, Jessica. I'm glitter and I glow. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing that with Google, actually. Google is now creating that program where they can um, build skills and provide skills training to those that want to forego university. Uh, so they're still giving them that development and growth. We're seeing a significant just change, I think, within the workplace and some organizations getting on board to say, how do we continue to feed them with that development and growth? Um, and it might look a little different than going to university. It might be you're going straight to business, back to business, and and we're getting you involved in um down that pipeline that you see for yourself within our organization early on. For so sure. does that mean, Jessica, that that desire to develop, does that change the role of what a great manager is? Or does that just say we all need, I don't know, development of opportunities? I think that it's both. I think um, from a manager standpoint, the role is constantly evolving, absolutely, as expectations within the workplace are changing. And as managers, you're, you're going to have to absolutely wear more of that coaching hat. Um, and I also think that um, developmental opportunities need to be capitalized on. And it doesn't necessarily have to look like it looked traditionally. You can have these these moments where you're able to learn and stretch and grow within your current role. And maybe it's, you're leading the team call, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily have the, the title of being the manager, but for that meeting, you're stepping into a leadership type of position. So I think it's about cultivating every single moment, every single opportunity within the roles that you are in so that we can develop people Developing people at all corners and in all facets is, I think, the way to go. Mm. I love that idea of maybe we develop managers to be better coaches, knowing that that coaching skill is something that's going to stick. And then we add key experiences to really develop leaders. Um, mm -hmm. Gallup's leadership development framework is uh, this idea of take the talent originally and then multiply it, which is similar to if you're familiar with um, talent multiplied by investment equals strength. Um, against the framework of how do you develop leaders on purpose, it's not, you know, Jessica said, it's not going to look like it always looked. It's not leave, go get your MBA and come back. Mm -hmm. um, what we know tends to work and what we very often work with a lot of our, our clients on is this idea of multiply the talent by a combination of key experiences and focus development. For sure. 
And so maybe it is that I'm the one who's leading the meeting, um, or maybe it's I'm going to you know, take an international assignment or go to a different part of the organization to get that cross-functional experience. Uh, but realizing that maybe you can even think about the attractiveness of this to people and figure out, is that something that's making my, you know, my team's eyes light up? Um, or, or are they finding purpose and potential and enjoyment somewhere else? For sure. I, I love the call out around the key experiences. I know mm-hmm. I've worked on a couple of clients where we actually do a key experience review, where we study the leaders that are currently in those top of the house seats, if you will, that C level, those those C level seats, and we are thematically extrapolating what are those key experiences and how can we recreate them at all levels to build the bench right, to prepare people to step into those manager seats and eventually into those those leadership types of seats. And so this is the type of disruption in in thinking around um, development that I think we're all speaking about. Mm. Um, How can we change the game on this, right? Yeah, so let me ask you all a question because you might have people in the audience also saying, you know, if you're just starting to create that culture of coaching as a leader, How do you make that leap if you haven't done it before where it doesn't look awkward or you're just coming out of the blue and you're like, okay, here we go, managers and employees, we're going to start coaching. Um, How do you, how do you take that leap? Oh, I love this question. I have to say I've been coaching executives for a financial institution Mm -hmm. and the financial institution, as many of them all are, and I came from that background, um, it tends to be more of a hierarchy. It tends to be more of a tough culture, uh, especially as it relates to development. I was coaching a couple of of executives who are newer to the institution. And what they have been finding is that they are meeting meeting a lot of pushback. Uh, and the pushback is not only coming from their peers, but it's also coming from their direct reports. And they're, they're mm-hmm. getting feedback like, you're not tough enough, you're not directive enough, you're mm-hmm. not really playing into this hierarchy like you should. And so, For some of you, many of you likely that are listening into this, you may be trailblazers within your within your organizations. So I think it's just thinking about what are the small wins? Um, Who are the leaders that you are getting the buy in from? And maybe it's starting small and 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 maybe it's you are starting a revolution within your organization. Right. But I just think it's it's interesting to have an employee tell you that you're not tough enough and that you're not directive enough. Mm-hmm. But you're really leading the charge of a new way of managing and a new way of leading within that organization. You mean if, if they're coaching, getting that feedback that they're that coaching, they're coaching, not tough coaching. Yes, they're coaching the people and they're like, well, just tell me what I should be doing. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I ju- we just wrapped up a cool Boston coach cohort with a client who um, is still struggling with that idea of, well, I don't have enough time to coach because I have to tell them what to do and I have to follow up on what they've done. And yeah. it, probably not just a coincidence that they're also struggling with trusting that people are doing anything if they're working from home. Mm-hmm. Um, but for them, it is a big leap. So Jacqueline, I appreciate just how do you make the leap, acknowledging that for a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals, being more advisory, asking more than telling, that is a leap. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm thinking back to the specific client saying, I don't have time to coach. Um, Another thing that we find to to be a, a, a new challenge or maybe a newly spotlighted challenge is how do you help managers and leaders learn how to prioritize their time? Mm -hmm. Um, and that idea of, okay, we want to nudge you toward more of this advisory role. This is how you develop others. Um, but it is a movement for a lot of people from I've, I was a great individual contributor because I worked really hard and I'm going to work really hard as a manager and think that my job is just to make sure that other people are working really hard. Um, and maybe you're still using that. Uh, I'm using my hands if you can't see this, the axis of important versus urgent. Yes. Well, really great leaders who are, as as Brian Brim, I know, said, you know, leading through compassion are also taking into account what's urgent, what's important, and where is the best developmental opportunities or where is, where's the people you know, part of mm-hmm. this? What perhaps has the most potential? You're know, coming back to something Jessica said of realizing I'm getting people done through work. I'm not just getting work done through people. So taking a pause to say, how am I prioritizing coaching? Mm-hmm. Um, and know that that 
that might mean I come across as soft, but then I think it's also saying, how do I take the feedback I'm getting? How do I Absolutely. add, if somebody's telling me I'm not being soft enough, how do I hear that? How am I like pliable and moldable enough to say if we're democratizing leadership development, that means we're inviting people to hold a mirror up to themselves mm -hmm. and say, what are my blind spots? What are some of those gaps that I might have? How can I be more mindful of it, either through my own development and, or through partnership or through both? For sure. Absolutely. And I think that's too where the the talent themes can come in handy, where you can you can be thinking about how you're showing up and presenting to your employees, to um, the the colleagues that you work with, uh, to other leaders that you work with or that you report up to. So you're taking that feedback and then able to self-regulate to say, what do I need to dial up? What do I, I maybe need to dial down? Or even to Jessica's point, if you have an employee that comes to you and says, just tell me what to do, what are their themes telling you about them? Um, you mm -hmm. still want to take that coaching approach, but you know, are they more analytical than more empathy in terms of how they want more facts and information and figures or want to be able to talk through that with you over maybe feelings? Um, so I think that would be even a useful tool to, to pull in to help individualize this approach. Absolutely. I think the other thing just to, to hone in on is, you know, creating buy-in um, especially if you are someone that's maybe you maybe mm -hmm. you feel like you are single-handedly trying to change the culture of the organization, like there are a lot of snowball effect uh, success stories out there where maybe you were the first one and then it grew and grew yeah. and grew. So I think it's also about uh, sharing your stories, showcasing your stories where you can. So thinking about your cult, your unique culture that you exist in, where are the opportunities for for maybe it's town halls, perhaps it's other recognition opportunities even, so that you mm -hmm. can showcase how how coaching works, why it works from a business standpoint. Because a lot of times that can also get people's attention, especially when you're trying to change a culture, right? Bringing it back to the business. Yeah, great call out. I think that also answers a number of questions that we're seeing in chat related to how do you how do you impact or create an effect on these resistant managers or leaders that say, hey, I just don't have the time. Um, the best practice sharing is a brilliant way. And it does the the hard work for you, the heavy lifting, because you've got the business outcomes and leaders and managers saying, hey, it works. And this is how it works. This is this is what we've seen in terms of productivity, retention, reduced absenteeism, um, team engagement, and so forth. I also think maybe we just honor the research here and you, you don't have to come up with the buy-in on your own. Mm -hmm. I wrote these down. I don't have it memorized, but <laughs> currently... You do exactly what I do. I was, a, I was about to look real <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> less than two in 10 employees strongly agree leadership communicates effectively with the rest of the organization. Only two in 10 employees strongly agree that leadership makes them feel enthusiastic about the future. And only a quarter of us agree our man strongly agree that our performance is managed in a way that motivates outstanding work. Mm -hmm. Folks, if, you, if that's not enough to say coaching <laughs> matters, then you've yes. got a bigger problem. And I think a, a very, you know, a lot of this does come back to seeing coaching not as making you feel better, but helping you do better. And really mm -hmm. the great, I mean, Jessica is one of my best coaches. And what she does really excellently is holds a space for communication. And I mean, if, if start with why and all the books around why you should start with why, it, um, it, it, there is a note to the world that that's an important point that we're missing. Otherwise, those wouldn't be topping charts in, you know, mm -hmm. in our, there wouldn't be such a market for us to start with why if we were getting this right. Yeah. Clearly, part of coaching is not just how clear are you about what the expectations are, but how well are you helping those expectations, those priorities, that passion infiltrate a level below and a level below that. Um, I think sometimes we can be really clear at a leadership level about where we're going, but it breaks down really yes. quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, coaching can be the link that keeps your connection between the levels of the organization, whether you're a leader or a manager or or somebody who's showing up every day just to be a rock star in your individual contributor role. Yes. Um, so yes, it is hard, but I think it's also about holding up a mirror to folks and saying, you know, how, how future ready are we? Mm -hmm. Um because it's easier now for people just to say, sorry, I'm out. I'm going to go to a place where I can wake up in the morning feeling like I know what we're doing and that I love it. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I can do that just by clicking onto a different internet location. <laughs> like your talent depends on you getting it right. For sure. Thank you for bringing that up too. Even the 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 aspect of leaders aren't always aware that um, they might be living in this world up here, but it's not trickling down to the other levels. Um, even when it comes to, to uh, learning and growth, 58% of leaders would strongly agree that they receive learning and growth, but then you take it down to the next level and only 39% of managers agree mm-hmm. that they're receiving learning and growth. These are the people that were, I think most leaders are assuming they can start to funnel up into a leadership position at some point in time, but if they're not receiving that coaching and the development and growth now, how are they going to perform when they're in that leadership position? But if there's a disconnect between the leader, the leaders and managers with, um, you know, growth and learning and development, then think about the disconnect that's happening between managers and individual contributors. So the more you can get maybe that one leader even that's a beacon and says, oh, I love the opportunity to coach. Um, I want to do more of it. Or they are doing it. They're implementing it and it's working. How can you get them to be that shining star and, and knowledge share with other leaders so that you can start to have more of that waterfall effect. Yeah. It's waterfall a great question. It's a million there. dollar question. <laughs> I want to go to the waterfall effect as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm but feeling I think, connectedness today. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to also just encourage folks that a lot of times it doesn't have to always, you don't have to always start from scratch. I know at Gallup, mm-hmm. we are hu- we are big on studying successes so that you can recreate more of those. So if this is a new initiative, study other initiatives that have worked in the organization. How did that mm-hmm. initiative get the traction? How did that initiative um, transcend throughout the entire organization, right? And I think it comes back down to the expectations around the the coaching initiative around, um, I love how Micah said, starting with why, right? Why why does this matter from a business standpoint? So maybe you start with the statistics and then as you're, you're, you're trying to roll this out, study those successful initiatives that you had in the past and recreate them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's also about study the individuals, right? So um, people should feel like if I want to improve, I can see that I can improve here. And mm. I mean, that gets bigger. It's mm-hmm. it's women's month. They should see that people who look and act like me can get better here, right? So that so I can look around and realize development is in my hands. I don't have to mm. wait for somebody to hand it to me. And there's lots of bigger ways than just your formalized programs that that needs to be underscored for folks. But it's also about how are you telling the story of what excellence looks like and making mm-hmm. sure that it is um, you're highlighting managers who think about loving people and process uh, that you I mean, we roll out Jessica yes. and I work together on a client who we both love, who um, we love all our clients, but Jessica and I don't always work together. <laughs> Let's just go there. <laughs> disclaimer. Um, a disclaimer. We're we're helping them define some of these expectations where we say, you know what, really great leaders inspire others. They they also think critically and they communicate effectively. And mm-hmm. being able to say, here's what excellence looks like. And then let's let's take an internal snapshot of who some of those leaders are. It's like building your own version of Gallup's strengths-based leadership book by being able to say, you know what? And I saw a question in the chat earlier about some types of leadership tend, or some types of talent tend mm-hmm. to be fast-tracked toward leadership. I think what we can say is the greatest leaders don't have their same styles in common. What they have is they're aware of who they are. They're aware of who they're not. They're working on those blind spots, Mm -hmm. but they're also leaning into, hey, this is my style and it's okay. So Mm -hmm. let's highlight some of that. It'll do two things. One, it'll make, to your point, Jacqueline, a more inclusive leadership culture. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it also encourages people to say, let's talk about what leadership means in our organization so that you can see this is a tough job. This is a job that's about putting others first, being almost, you know, servant in chief. Um, (laughs) This is a job that's about holding (laughs) awkward tension and having critical conversations and creating space to coach. And that can be something you can be excellent at. 
I love this call out, Micah, around bringing it down to the individual and getting really curious there because yes. coaching and people are messy, but it can be really interesting to bring that curious lens to it, to study to study the people. Um, and I think it also comes down to expectations, right? So one of the things we know is that um, People in the workplace want more immediacy within their conversations. Mm -hmm. And what that creates is not only the, the space to have different types of conversations and maybe even more of those future oriented conversations where you're getting more of an inclination of where does this person want to go in their career? But it also allows for you to understand on a daily basis, what are the barriers that the person is experiencing? Exactly. What are the needs that this person has from a workplace perspective? What are their talents and how are they showing up daily so that you can individualize your approach? So yes, call outs. Yeah. I think that's what makes it a priority when leaders might say, what's the priority behind having these coaching conversations? I don't have the time for it. That's why you need to do it because you are creating a, a greater pipeline of productivity by having more of these quick connects with your employees and understanding what are the barriers to their success, what's driving them, because I might have a project and this is something I can delegate to them, get it off my plate. It's giving them growth and development. But if they're not having those quick connect conversations, they could be creating a large bottleneck of productivity without even knowing it. And if their business outcomes focus, which many are as leaders, that's going to impact your business outcomes. Um, so thank you, Jessica. I think you just, you know, uh, both of you just gave everyone in the audience a great point as to how we can flip this and say this is why it's a priority. Jim. I think, I think yeah, let me, let me jump in on this because I think based on what I'm hearing in the chat room, Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we have an expectation that we can turn this thing on a dime inside of organizations. You know, they're frustrated because we have leaders mm -hmm. that can't make the leap to being a coach. They're, they are top down driven. They are, they're not doing their role kind of as a manager or as a leader. And, and I think, and I want to quiz you guys. I mean, this takes a while. Uh, um, Jacqueline, yes. you and I are spending a bunch of time about successful leadership. That's this series, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's others. Next week, we're going to talk uh, with Hologic, right? They're coming on to yes. talk with us and give us some best practice. And I think this is actually an element we miss in, in our success story series that we have on Called to Coach, where people aren't listening for those, this didn't happen yesterday. Like, mm -hmm. we started this journey three to five years ago. Mm -hmm. We, as we think about those steps that are on page 60 of it's the manager about building a strengths based culture, not that I'm geeky about that book, but it's on that page. If you want to find it, um, starting with, it has to start with senior leadership, right? We got to, we, we have to get that. And then no organization is perfect. And so you're, as you're making these transitions, it's going to take time. And even when you are switching, there's going to be resistance. And so you have to work through that, Micah, I want to throw that to you a little bit and, when we think about best practices for organizations that are working through this, because that's what it takes. It takes several iterations of the Q12. It might take several years of developing a strength-based culture. As you've looked at, and, and Jessica will ask you the same question as well, what's common in those organizations that are making the shift or that are doing it right? And what do you see in them that's helping them move along the journey over time as opposed to we want to fix this tomorrow? What's the geekiest question you've ever asked, Jim? <laughs> it's great to see and you I love it. back in action. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm instantly, I'm thinking that we're talking about change management. We're not just talking about if you approach it as I just want my managers to be more like, bo like coaches mm -hmm. um, and that's in isolation, then it, 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 first of all, it'll feel heavier. And second of all, it probably won't last unless you've, you're relying on sheer talent of a bunch of really great people. Um, I think it's about how do you take better stock of all the systems? So um, understanding, are we defining excellence through how we rate, rank, count, measure performance? Um, are we allowing a little bit more space in terms of what we actually expect leaders and managers to spend their time doing? Um, what are we recognizing? 
informally and formally? Um, what are we saying our priorities are and how are we walking that walk as well? And Ralph, I saw in the chat was um, challenging this idea that we need to have this waterfall effect of start at the top. But the truth is, if I don't believe it's a leadership priority, um, I'm never going to get that extra oomph of sustainability and of, I think, extra energy toward whatever I'm going toward, whether that's adopting more of a cult coaching culture or, you know, putting my seatbelt on when I drive. Like I have to believe that somebody who um, is in charge of setting priorities also believes this is a priority. Um, so best practice in terms of, you know, how have we gone about it? It's first as you see it as a whole systemic change that needs, I think, proper change management approaches around it. Second is that, gosh, you got to think about hope at the same time. You know, so yeah. I've, it's, I've just recently rediscovered Making Hope Happen, the book by Shane Lopez. And there is so much even just in the first 10 pages that's just hitting mm -hmm. me between the eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we talking about this in terms of what's going to be better when we get there? Why is that important to us? And what's mm -hmm. the next step we can take? So uh, us sitting here saying, gosh, this takes years, uh, kind of kills my adaptability, which you heard I have. <laughs> I'm thinking if it takes years, I have strategic and adaptability. I'm out. I'm going to go next door. <laughs> so, my, Micah, to that question, though, let, me, let me interrupt mm -hmm. your train of thought on this. To that question, Lisa asked a good one. W what yes. are some quick wins? Yeah. So what have you seen? What are some quick wins that lead to longevity? Because I think we need to have yeah. hope both mm -hmm. near and Far. Well, and I'm thinking it's not just have hope, it's the practice of hope. It's that right. you're talking about what what can this be in 30 days? When is your next opportunity to coach? What are you going to do in that opportunity? And that comes back to a quick win is get those leaders some coaching, right? Help them experience what it feels like to receive coaching. Um, in many organizations, that means that you're redefining a negative connotation where coaching was a punitive activity. Um, but it's it's maybe even thinking about coaching circles where you are bringing in people outside of the traditional HR space um, who maybe are, are influencers throughout the organization and saying, hey, here's, here's what a 15-minute coaching conversation could sound like. Mm -hmm. It's ask, listen, respond, that's it. Um, we've done some really great, I think, interventions that were drawn from other goals, not just we want to be better coaches. And I think that's also an important thing is that how could you have this change, um, grow some tentacles of reasons why you're doing it? Um, and one of the organizations I'm thinking about right now, they brought us in to deal with burnout. And so our answer was we're going to bake in coaching habits and we're going to bake in some coaching behaviors, but it wasn't just to drive coaching forward on its own. It was in or if we can be better listeners, be more tied into our people. I mean, Jessica mentioned before, people want that immediacy of, hey, I just did something hard. Does anybody know? <laughs> does anybody uh, care? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody want to ask me how Are it went there? or help me figure out what I could do better next time? And honestly, great coaching in that moment is my my boss does it to me all the time. Hey, Mike, I know you had like a red day because I do. He also knows I color code my calendar based on difficulty. Um, and he'll just say, hey, what do you think went well? He wasn't there. I was on Zoom with, you know, 75 <laughs> other people in other countries. But he says, what do you think went well? What do you think you're going to do better next time? When's the next time you can do better? Those are three questions and that so is coaching. Great. And and so I think it is looking for the, the frozen to next right thing and doing that in addition to that systemic, you know, treating it like any other change project that you want to adopt. Jessica, I heard That's Micah say example. focus on managers. Like in, in, in that, like maybe a, a strategy short term <laughs> is focused on, man, we've been saying this a lot. I mean, if you're <laughs> yeah. listening to this now and this is the first time you've heard us say focus on managers. What else would you add to what Micah said, Jessica? Gosh, I like echo everything that Micah <laughs> has, has been saying. She's so brilliant. I think, you know, managers are the bedrock of an organization. So it's great to have the focus there. Um, uh, and I would echo the sentiment around like this, um, this cascading effect that you have to bring into the organization. And um, culture change is like cha turning around a ship in an ocean. So I think that you have to celebrate the wins um, along the journey, you know, and as I think about some of the clients that I've been working with more recently, I think it's also giving yourself grace along the journey. So knowing that it's going to be difficult, you're, you may be 
a trailblazer, you may be um, meeting a lot of red tape, mm -hmm. but the small wins can get you through that red tape. So you know, for example, um, I gave the, I talked about some of the executives that I'm coaching in this very hierarchical organization where the only places that they actually feel that they can be themselves for a lot of these leaders is either with their team because they cherry picked and hand picked them um, or with maybe one or two other executives um, and executive leaders that they've cultivated relationships with. Uh, so I, I, I do go back to, yes, it's about the small wins, but it's also about being able to give yourself ease and grace along the journey and having those people that you pick up along the way that maybe you can vent to, that maybe mm -hmm. you can bounce ideas off of, that maybe you can um, just have the space to also communicate the difficulties that you're experiencing. I think it's, and we would be remiss if we just said, just deal with it. It'll change eventually, mm -hmm. but do what you need to do to be okay along the journey. And I think sometimes we miss that. So that's the only other thing I would add. Jacqueline, what, what would you add to that conversation of those two? That's great. Well, what I hear is um, even leaping off of or, or kind of, I don't know, going off of what Jessica said, that also taps into the well-being and burnout piece that leaders might be experiencing. So who are those partners that you feel like you can just you know, take five with or take 10 minutes with and and share out the difficulties you're experiencing or use them as a thought partner and bounce off some ideas for some challenges that you're incurring or just to talk through communication for how you want to translate a message down to the rest of the organization. Um, but then doing so in a space where you're walking outside together, even if it's socially distanced, or you're walking and talking by the phone. I've known a lot of leaders that will just get on the phone with somebody else and they're walking outside at the same time in completely different neighborhoods just to be able to, to share out. But there's a lot to be said about you know connecting with a partner as you're going through that experience and sharing the lived experiences together, um, but then doing so in a way where you might be outdoors or you're getting your blood flowing too, because we know that, again, you've heard me say this a number of times in these sessions, that generates a lot of creativity and thought, and that creates a better sense of well-being too, so you're able to tackle what's going on in the workplace and look at it in a new perspective. I love the idea of getting somebody who can give you real feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this before I was at Gallup, um, when, and even my first few years, we all had board of directors meetings, um, yeah. and where you would gather your trusted advisors within the organization um, and have a meeting about how well you're doing. I mean, that yes. probably fits um, just in your question about what is focused development. That'd mm -hmm. be something I'd classify under focused development is if me and my six most trusted advisors here. I bring them to the seat at the table and I am the topic, my growth and development, my progression through leadership is the topic. And I trust what they're going to tell me. Um, I think that's a, imagine even taking a walk with somebody who could say, what kind of feedback are you getting? Um, yes. Let's talk about how, how you're inspiring others, how you're leading change, how you're doing these expectations that we have mm -hmm. of leaders and of managers. And we're treating your development your leadership development, just like we would treat any other goal that you're trying to pursue. Um, I think it's so important. I mean, we can't ignore the fact that having Absolutely. a best friend at work is a pretty important thing. Um, yeah. What if this was also thinking about those developmental partners who are giving you the real-time feedback in the moment? For sure. Absolutely. What, what about that element of, of coaching up? Um, you know, I know as a, as in my role, my manager is really good at some things and less good is that, can I say it that way? Less good at others. And I've kind of learned to lean into what he's best at and get that from him. And when I need coaching, uh, I'll be honest, uh, we just yesterday, we had a call, Jacqueline and I were spending some time talking about this. Micah jumped in and I got seriously coached, <laughs> right? I got, it, and I needed it in the moment. I needed it. What What is the responsibility from individuals, both leaders, managers, individual contributors to understand their leadership structure above them? And also mm -hmm. lean into that to know it, to, to say, hey, my current manager, my current boss, whatever, 
has these strengths and I, they do these things well. What's that responsibility look like? And Micah, oh, your your one. eyes raised there. What would you say? Well, to that? <laughs> and that's why we're tribal human beings, Jim. Mm -hmm. Let's go deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why nobody lives with only one other person like and and when I mentioned the board of directors there's more than one other seat mm -hmm. um I, I think it's about identifying your own blind spots and knowing who makes a great partner for you but also knowing your partner's blind spots and I do use the word partner in place of your own manager because you should be able I mean great collaboration happens there and you should mm -hmm. be able to name, here's what I bring to the table that they do not. And here's what they bring to the table that I do not. And if we're talking about managing up, they may bring permission, autonomy, um, funding that you do not. Um, and you also need to know, okay, if we think about the two of us as a pair, what are we missing? Is it the feedback um, on how I'm showing up to an audience that my manager doesn't know about? Well, I can't expect them to know that. Um, so either I ask them to figure it out or I go find it somewhere else. Part of democratizing leadership development is that we're in charge of our own progress. And I think far too often people wait um, to ask for an opportunity to, to move up or to develop or they say they apologize for it. They'll go to their manager and say, hey, I'm really sorry, but I want to get better at this or or um, I, 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 I am in, interested in doing something different and they're afraid that somehow it, it shows some disrespect to what they're doing in the moment. Um, I think we should constantly as leaders be on the lookout for that kind of energy and say, mm -hmm. yes, that's fantastic and I'll help you get there. And one of the ways you can develop your leadership is to expand the circle of people you trust who can bring different perspective to how you're doing for sure. So my quick answer, Jim, is stop expecting your manager to be excellent at everything. <laughs> yeah. Just or good. even, or even expecting your manager to know exactly what it is that you need. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times, then we do this all the time, just not even within the corporate environment, but just as human beings, we make assumptions, right? So part of the power of being curious and asking questions is being able to go into that space to learn something new about someone. I think mm -hmm. Clifton Strains is a great way to bring a relational shorthand. Perhaps if you're newer to that uh, manager employee relationship or manager leader relationship and starting to get to know that person. But I think you have to ask questions around expectations. Um, and, and, and the manager should be asking questions for sure. But as the employee, you have a responsibility as well. Um, from an expectation standpoint, we know that within our employee uh, employee engagement database, only 50% of the folks in our database can give a five or strongly agree to the item. I know what is expected of me at work. And I think expectations, it's not just about your job functionality, but it also transcends, transcends into your developmental needs. And if you're not, mm -hmm. if you don't feel like you can be candid about that, start with question asking about that so that you can do a temperature check on how your manager operates or how your, your executive oh. oper operates around this so that you can actually get what you need. This is why she's my coach. <laughs> <laughs> Talent and action. Talent action. Well, I, I find sometimes uh, as we do these sessions, uh, folks are looking for this very prescriptive, like, just tell me these things to do, like, mm -hmm. or we've tried that and it hasn't worked. And this is such a human problem. Like, this is such yeah. a hard, hard human problem to, to overcome. And, it, and mm. it, it takes, a, it, yes, it's hard. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work. I think the onus is both on us and our structure that exists. You know, at Gallup, we're such a flat structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes I, I, you know, we, we, a lot of folks see leadership as this, this up and down. And I really, I, I really see it as a, as a sideways. In fact, the folks that, that, um, are responsible uh, underneath me for leadership, I, I, I put them ahead of me, like in, mm. in that and saying, you're really, really important to me, but we all play a role, right? It's not like we have workers and we have managers. I mean, I, I know a lot of managers, including me who do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of things I'm responsible for. Jacqueline, in your experience, are you seeing, are, is the trend in the work that you're doing and maybe for the three of you, is it getting better? Are we seeing changes where that leadership, that boss to coach is it's flattening? Do you see any of that? Jacqueline? 
I think it varies by organization um, and their their attitude and their desire to want to create that inclusive leadership culture in this culture of coaching. When they are all on board and it's all hands on deck, you just see the momentum um, and those the the small wildfires, as I call them, just burn <laughs> across the organization, and you just mm -hmm. see momentum with strengths or engagement or performance. When you have some on board and others aren't, I feel like it's a little bit slower of a burn and we celebrate those wins and we knowledge share. What are the best practices? What are they doing so that we can spread the good news, the, the great business outcomes and so forth? And then some are just more resistant. Um, and if you're in one of those organizations and you're, you're trying to get them bought in, who do you have? Who's that one stakeholder that's a leader? Um, that is, you know, their eyes and ears are open to what you have to say and they're interested in seeing the shift and then start small. But what would you say, ladies? What have you seen in your experience? It's varied so much for me. I, I mean, I, I, I think you're spot on, Jacqueline. I love the call out of the variability. Mm -hmm. um, within the workplace, I do think that we are at the tip of the iceberg on this. You know, we just think about mm -hmm. mature economies, and I'll just take the U.S. for example. From an economics perspective, the last thing to develop is the human being. So for a long time, we went down this rabbit hole of Six Sigma and being lean and squeezing out efficiencies, and now we are at the, the, the top of the food chain here from an economics perspective and cultivating human potential, cultivating human capital. And I think that there's going to be a lot of innovation still to come and a lot of tweaks because I don't think that we have gotten it right so far, but I also think that it speaks to the complexity of human beings. There's not necessarily one approach that's blanketed and works across all organizations because I don't know, I think a lot of times organizations are like human beings and their complexities. You're not wrong. I think I'm going to take a dose of my own medicine of treat it like an entire change in a system. And mm. I, I am seeing a change in the idea of how we define what it what the role of a manager is. Mm -hmm. That is changing if you look at even how we're educating business students. Um, I'm lucky enough to be here in the state of Nebraska and we've got the Clifton Strengths Institute that says, hey, mm. if you're going to be a business student, you're going to study what's right with people and how to coach them. When I was going to school, if you were smart, you were a lawyer or a doctor. That was it. If you had a business idea, you just went out and, and did it. Um, and if you majored in business, sorry, in my limited perspective, when I was 17, the only people who majored in business were the ones who didn't know what else to do. <laughs> and I, that's, to my knowledge, that's, that's really not true anymore. I look mm -hmm. at how we celebrate great managers. If you even just mm -hmm. check out, you know, Gallup has a manager of the year that we give as an award, uh, you know, across our client base. We talk about great places to work. Um, students today talk about what they want to be when they grow up and we can navigate toward how do you want to feel when you work? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, even the fact that we talk about mental health and we talk about burnout and it's okay to bring up how you feel and how you feel at work. That to me is a monumental shift. Um, and I think that's what it's going to take is to be able to say, um, you know, you have influence based on who you are. Your strengths are probably your best avenue to influence. And you don't have that just so you can lead. You have that so that you can love. Mm -hmm. And and if you if that's something that attracts you, then maybe being a manager is a great job for you. And if it's not, let's figure out what you love and who you love and how you love and how you offer that compassion in a different way and also have that be okay. Mm. I think, Micah, what I hear is it's going to take one person at a time. I think sometimes mm -hmm. we've approached this so systematically yes. in the same manufacturing Jessica, to what you just said, the Six Sigma and Lean and all those things, like those were an attempt to simplify and at an organizational level kind of change everything. And, and I think what I'm hearing and what you guys are saying is it's still about coaching and it's about coaching one person at a time, right? It's mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. getting managers straightened or, or fixed. Nah, those are all wrong words. Coached in being better managers, right? Yes. It's about helping individual contributors and SMEs get coached. It's about executive and, and leadership teams being coached, right? One person at a time is what it's going to take to get this done. Jacqueline, unfortunately, like this has been a lot of fun. We should do this every yes. Friday. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 
<laughs> That'd be awesome. It didn't scare me for having a conflict. I it, it actually tied up in my basement because I wanted the roll instead. Yeah. So I just attacked him and said he was busy. And there was a flat yeah. tire on the side of the road somewhere. Uh, Jacqueline, we're, we're coming up on time. Why don't you do a job, your job to wrap this up for us and, 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 and kind of bring us in for a landing. Yes. Um, I was looking at a lot of the comments that were coming through in chat too, and I feel like this really resonates. And a lot of the audience is saying there's a significant opportunity for us to coach managers, whether it's an internal coach that's within the organization already and can work with the leader to help highlight the, the value and importance of coaching their managers, or whether you are a leader yourself and you recognize that this is an opportunity not just for you, but for your fellow um, leader colleagues, so to speak, there's a lot of value in being able to, um, you know, take, take what we've learned today and individualize, start going from one manager to one manager to one manager and really helping them grow and develop. Um, because again, based on what Gallup's research is telling us, 39% of managers strongly agree that they're receiving learning and growth opportunities. And if we want to funnel them up and create leaders out of them, we need to be focused on that people development now. Um, we're, we are going to follow this topic uh, next week with a case study. So we're really bringing this to life with Allison Bebo, who is the um, senior vice president, uh, the global head of human resources at Hologic. And she will be sharing out uh, from her perspective as a leader, how are they creating a culture of, um, you know, strengths-based, engagement-oriented, performance-focused work? Um, how, how is this culture? Where, where did it come from? How did it start? How long did it take them? Uh, you will hear it all. So we will really bring this to life even further with a leader that will come in and speak to us. And then after that, you'll hear from Ruth and Jackie, uh, and they will give some best practices on how they coach leaders. Yeah, I'm excited Jim? what's coming up. Robert yeah. Gapsa is also joining us next week. And yes. we recorded him last year on the five, you know, the five things it takes to build a strength based culture. And they at the time they were doing this at Whole Logic. This is super yeah. cool. Like this is a follow up mm. a year later. Wow. To to be like, okay, what what actually happened? Yes. So if you want real stories, you got to join us next week. Head over to gallup.eventbrite.com right now and register. Um, and, and join us, join us live. So you can ask these questions live with that. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available now in Gallup access. And there's a lot, they keep adding more every day. So go to gallup.com slash Clifton strengths. Or if you can't remember that, I didn't, I didn't realize this till this week. If you go to cliftonstrengths.com, it takes you to the same spot. So if you, <laughs> if you can, I don't know how the guy who does land of websites, did, we learn something know. new every day. Cliftonstrengths.com. You can head up there. Cliftonstrengths.com doesn't take you somewhere else. I know it's great. No, it gets yeah. you there as well. If you have any, if you're looking for coaching, master coaching, or you want to become a Gallup certified strengths coach, or you want help with your organization to do some of the things that we talked about, send us an email coaching at Gallup. Com. We'll get back right to you. We're excited to talk about the 2021 uh, Gallup at Work Summit that is coming up at June 8th and 9th. We're super pumped about mm -hmm. it. Two days this year, lots of sessions. Sachin Nadella from Microsoft is coming to be our keynote. It's going to be pretty great. You can register right now. Gallup at Work, all one word, Gallup at Work. Dot com. You can find us on any social platform. And apparently this thing called Instagram is super hot right now. I don't know. Mike <laughs> is all over What are we it. getting on TikTok? <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Let's, can we not? Can we not do TikTok? But uh, you can follow us on any social site just by searching Clifton Strengths. And we'd love to have you do that there as well. Thanks for listening. Because we went long, there'll be no post show. But thanks for coming out. We'll see you next Friday. With that, we'll Thank say goodbye. You, Jessica.